Well, you may not know this, but we had an election this week, in case you've been under a rock somewhere. Um, and it looks like, you know, it, it's over. It looks like uh, Joe Biden will be our next president. And looks like the Dem- Democrats will control the House and the Republicans most likely will control the Senate. Now, who knows what will happen with courts and litigation and all of that. I, I doubt anything will change. But as I hope you've been seeing all week and being reminded of, no matter what changes or doesn't change, Jesus is still king. Do you know that this morning? Hmm? Do people see that? Do the people know that you know that? Do they see it in your conversations? Do they see it in the way that you act? Do they see it in your Facebook posts? Do they know through your life that Jesus is still king? I say this because sometimes we come to church and we're like, Jesus is king. We've got our hands in the air. We're praising Jesus. We're up and jumping up and down. And then we get on Monday morning and we're like, what is going to happen? I don't know. Everything's going to fall apart. The world is coming to an end. They're coming for my guns and my liberty. They're coming after me. And we're panicked. And people see more fear than they do faith. We look at a world that would not announce or remember or even acknowledge that Jesus is still king. He's not king. He's just another religious dude, another point of view to look at. So sometimes it can be hard to remember that Jesus is still king. But in the end, if Jesus is who he says he is, it doesn't matter if a majority of the American public acknowledge Jesus is king. It doesn't matter if the supreme, the justices of the Supreme Court acknowledge Jesus as king. It does not matter if the entire whole of Congress acknowledges God or his word. They will all stand before him one day. And they will have to give an account for their lives, just like you and me. Jesus is still king. Let us not take his patience as an act of absence, for he is at work behind the scenes, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 8, where it says that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like anybody? A day, that's right. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with all of us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Jesus says, like he said in, in John chapter 18, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. He goes, my kingdom is not like your kingdom. It's not like any kingdom that has ever been or ever will be. It's not based on your timing or your expectations of what a kingdom should do. It's clear as you read in scripture that our creator moves in the world in ways that would differ from how you or I might think a God should move or act differently than you or I think a God should act if we had his same authority and power. Oh, and we should praise God for that because we would mess things up. Speaking of messing things up, my thing's falling here. Hold on. Everybody holding that thought. What is it? All right, let's try this. Here we go. Is this a weird look? Peekaboo. <laughs> Anybody know Isaiah 55, 8, 9? Where Isaiah says about God that my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. For as high or than the heaven is than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He says in another part of the scripture that you can't even conceive what it is I'm doing. You have even clue. You cannot even imagine it. And because of these truths, a follower of Jesus is not worried. He is not panicked. She is not panicked, no matter what election outcome there is, no matter what is going on in the world, no matter what pandemic there is. In fact, a follower of Jesus does not worry or panic about anything because they know God is at work and he will set things right in his time. Amen. Jesus is king. 
Now, my, my desire and my hope is that this reminder will bring you some peace this morning. We all could use a little peace right now. But I also hope that this peace does not cause you just to be like, all right, God's got this. Let me put my feet up on the counter, kick back, and, and wait for Jesus to return. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, if you put your faith and trust in Christ as you, as in him as your Lord and Savior, you have a call on your life. 1 Peter 2.9, it says, you are a chosen race. Speaking of all believers, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's the AC unit, in case you're wondering. I've never heard it come on before. I was like, what is that? I thought our subwoofer was about to blow. That is the call on our life, to proclaim the excellencies of God. Did you know that? That is what we should be obsessed with, what we should be thinking about day in and day out. How do I proclaim the king to a world that badly needs to know him? How do I point people to the king? In your decision-making in your life, does that cross your path? When you're posting on Facebook, when you're writing emails, when you're sending texts, when you're Snapchatting, when you're talking to people at work, is it ever in the back of your mind of how do I point people to the king? It's a call on your life. Doesn't matter who's president, who runs the House, who runs the Senate. What government is in place? We are to point people to the king. And what is the goal of this pointing people to the king? Is it just to advertise his name? No, it is to create heart change. It says here in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, followers of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and who? That's right, the Holy Spirit. And this is a, a, another reason that we make a mistake anytime that we put the hope of our gospel, the hope of our Christian faith in the government. Because this is something the government can never do in making disciples. Now, I'm not saying that it's bad for Christianity to influence our government, how it operates. I would love if every member of the Senate and the Congress was a sold-out believer in Jesus Christ. As DC Talk would say, if they were all Jesus freaks. I'd love that. But no government can ever make disciples. Because no government can bring heart change. The, the government is there to create laws and policies that promote good and, and punish and prevent evil. But no government can create heart change. When religion is forced on its people, it creates hypocrites. And it causes people to despise that religion. Do you need an example? Just study Europe. Example after example. It's not the government's job. And this is, if you remember, the only people group that Jesus got really angry at all the time was the Pharisees. Because, because they were all trying to bring change through laws. In fact, he called them, Matthew 23, he called them whitewashed tombs. What a great phrase. Whitewashed tombs. He says, you're so clean and squeaky on the outside because you're following all these laws, but you're dead. You have no heart change. You have no relationship with your Father in heaven. This is why we can never put our hope in our government to usher in the rest of the kingdom of God because the government cannot bring heart change. The only thing that brings heart change is the Holy Spirit through his work, the word of God, and the church. And if you sit here as a believer in Christ, when I say the church, I am talking about you. I'm not talking about four walls and a roof. We are the church. We are called to bring this heart change into the world. Now, I know for some of you, you're like, yeah, it's from Jesus. But you're also, on the other hand, you're worried. You're worried like out of this election, you're concerned that Christian, uh, Christians freedoms to point people to the king will be limited. You know, and I would agree with your concerns. 
It's my belief that we're going to see the freedoms for Christians continue to diminish over the next couple generations. I mean, God has been forgotten about in our families, which leads to God not showing up in our government, which leads to God being removed from our schools, which leads to God being removed from our society. We're watching the fallout of effects this, the effects of this fallout now, and it will continue to unfold. I don't read anywhere in Scripture that he says things are going to get better. Sorry for the bad news. And I believe this is a coming reality no matter who is president. Who owns Congress? Who owns Senate? It is a coming reality for our nation, sadly for the world. Now, let's say I'm right. The question is, how do we as Christians respond to this? And this is an important question to ask because I feel like far too many of us are like Christian chicken littles. We run around yelling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, everybody's out to get us. We're paranoid that there's this grand coup coming after us. I feel like that we're so concerned about our rights getting trampled that we've lost sight of what Jesus has called us to do. I mean, sometimes as Americans, I wonder if we're more passionate about our rights than we are the mission of Christ. We get caught up sometimes in these small little Christian wars. I remember a few years ago, well, more than a few years ago, the whole like happy holidays things came up and, and we, we were getting, uh, where people stopped using Merry Christmas so much. You guys remember that, right? And I remember people would rant on Facebook of how we've got to put Christ back into Christmas and they would just be so angry that Christ is being taken out of Christmas. You know, and I, I remember talking to people and, I remember this one lady I talked to, and she's like, yeah, I was at Target, and I was checking out, and this lady said to me, happy holidays. Well, let me tell you, I told her, Merry Christmas. I told her. I was like, well, good, I'm, I'm glad you revealed the love of Christ to them. But we get this attitude, this big old Christmas chip on our shoulder. Now listen, I would love it if everybody was a Christian. I would love it if everybody said, hey, Merry Christmas to you. But I have to realize not everybody's a Christian. Not everybody knows the hope that can be found in Christ. And frankly, if my faith is dependent on whether someone else says Merry Christmas to me or not, that would not be much of a faith. I don't need everybody else to acknowledge Christ and Christmas for me to know that he's there. And I think sometimes we get so obsessed with keeping like Christ and Christmas when we really should be making sure that we're, we're focused on keeping Christ in, in Christian and being a Christian. So rather than me demanding that somebody repeats the same phrase I do afterwards, I praise my goal as they say happy holidays to them. I'll just say, hey, Merry Christmas. Not in a Merry Christmas, you're going to hell because you said Happy Holidays. Just say it, and a Merry Christmas. And then live and act and see them see me interact with other people in such a way that I show them what Christ is. I remember one time when my kids were little um, and, and they were all bugging me for gum in the aisle. And I was just at the end of my rope. You ever been there? Maybe you're more spiritual parents than I am. And I was just like, will you, you know, you know, be quiet, in other words. Uh, I didn't curse, but you know what, I mean, what phrase I used. And then uh, so, you know, I was so angry. And then I got up to the teller, you know, the person, or the cashier, and then I'm like, Merry Christmas. And as I'm walking out, I'm like, oh, what did I really show them about Christ? Because I was really way more angry than I needed to be. We need to be more concerned that we're showing Christ in Christmas than we demanding other people to say it. And this goes for every lot in life. Now listen, there, there may become a day when, when Christians face true persecution. 
There may come that day. But until our churches are bombed, until our homes are burned, until our families are murdered for the call of Christ, like 245 million other people around this earth, things are not that bad. They're not that bad for us to be deterred from our focus of pointing people to the king. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. In other words, we don't need to be afraid. We are loved by God. We are powered by a spirit, so we don't need to be paranoid. That's the Jeff translation. Hear me on this. If we spend more time talking about what is being done to us, than what Christ has done for everyone, we're missing the mark. And a golden opportunity to point people to the king. You guys with me so far? Now the other thing I said, I hear a lot. So we need to get back to being a Christian nation. Now, why this country was built on some Christian principles, not all our founders were Christians. They were deists. They believed in a God. But to think they were all sold-out evangelical people for Jesus, they were a holy nightly worship service, speaking in tongues, laying their hands on people, and that's just not accurate. We cannot rewind the clock. This country is where it is. We cannot turn back time. It would, and it's useless to try to focus on that. It would be like us, you know, uh, planting a bunch of trees in the yard and then someone cutting them down. We don't help ourselves by trying to prop up dead limbs. Rather, instead of, of resenting this cultural movement away from God, slouching into bitter withdrawal, God will punish them or charging into angry activism, we should accept the challenge that is before us and be willing to serve from a position of weakness. As one pastor said, to minister from the margins. And believers throughout the ages have lived, they have flourished under repressive pagan governments. I mean, look at Jesus. He did not come in with any power. He came in riding a donkey. Look at the believers, of the the first century believers. They lived under a merciless political regime. Most of them were, were murdered for their faith. And yet they led us to the most impactful thinking and faith in Christianity that changed the entire world. It's influenced the world in so many ways we don't even know. Even those who call themselves secular and don't believe in God, the principles that they spout and aspire to are based on Christian principles. They just don't realize it. And he did this, they did this all from a position of weakness. And let me show you how they did it. A couple of ways. Like I said, they faced persecution beyond anything that we have experienced. And you know what's one of the things they still taught? To honor and respect your authorities. 1 Peter 2.17, he says, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, fear God, and he says, honor the emperor. Honor the emperor. And some of you, you will say, I will never respect President Biden. Or I remember when President Trump was brought into office, it was hashtag not my president. I tell you, if you're a believer, I want you to go read about the emperors of Peter's time. I want you to read about the things that they did. Read about them. And then after you read about them, ask yourself that if Peter told Christians to respect these kind of leaders, how should that change how we view our president? If you don't respect your president, your members of Congress, your Senate, you are in sin. Period. And you need to seek the Lord's forgiveness. 
And I don't care what they act like or who they are. They are in a position of authority and they are deserving of honor. And let me tell you, we are just as messed up as they are. Don't think people wouldn't think we were complete morons if we were in those positions. We got to get off our high horses. I don't care if they're Democrat, Libertarian, whatever party. We pray and we honor our leaders. And we pray. And, 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 and I want to tell you what, here's a great thing about prayer, and this goes for everything beyond our leaders. It is like the greatest antidote to us setting our heart and vilifying those that we don't agree with. It changes your heart when you, when you pray for your leader. Not pray judgment, be clear. Pray God's blessing in their life. In fact, I, I was reading an article by President, uh, Pastor Eugene Cho. He pastors in Seattle. And he says, one time you got to meet Pres President Obama. And he sat in a room with other leaders and they went around and they introduced themselves. And at one point he goes, hey, my name's Eugene Cho. I'm a pastor. I want you to know, President, that I'm praying for you. And Pro President Obama, Obama replied back, well, thank you. But can you make sure that you also pray for my wife and children for their safety? And he said in that moment, President Obama stopped being a Democrat, Democratic president and he was a husband and a father all of a sudden who was worried about his wife and children. I think that's revolutionary to realize that President Trump, President Biden, or President-elect Biden, they are a man just like us. They're human, just like us. They have worries and stresses and insecurities, just like us. They're just magnified because of the position they're in. They are in desperate need of our prayer. And then this idea of honoring goes beyond just prayer. It also means sometimes supporting and going along with your government, even when you don't like what they're doing. Because governments can be frustrating. Don't believe me? Go down and try to get a driver's license right now. I'll see you in three Sundays. They can be absolutely frustrating. But this does not override your call on your life to point people to Christ. Let me give you an example. In Matthew 17, there was these people who came to the followers of Jesus and they go, hey, is, is, are you, in these, you, are you and Jesus going to pay the temple tax? There was a temple tax at that time for the upkeep of the temple. And so one of the disciples goes, Jesus, hey, we're going to pay this or what? And Jesus, long story short, said, you know what? We are free from paying this tax. We don't need to pay this tax. But then he says something so revolutionary. He says, but I'll tell you what. As not to give an offense, let us pay the tax anyway. They were asking for a tax that Jesus said, we don't need to pay, but we're going to pay it anyway to keep a good relationship with them. Most of us, we're so obsessed with our rights that if we don't agree with what's going on, then we're like, no, I'm not doing this. Like a kid throwing a temper tantrum. Huh. You see it the way we post and the way that we talk. But Jesus says, we're going to do it anyway. That's not to give an offense. And it makes me think, like, how many Christians are up in arms and over the COVID restrictions? And I know this is a messy topic and very emotional. We may not like all of them. We may not agree with some of them. But is it really worth creating a horrible witness for Jesus Christ? Is it really worth it? to kick and to scream and to call our governor a clown. What does that show the world about Christ? Now, there are times when we should oppose our government, when they are commanding us to do things against the word of God. But with that said, realize that any action we take against our government will be judged by God on the last day. So when you are in a rush to get up in arms, you better think about that really hard because you will have to stand before God and give an account to why you chose not to honor your authority as you're commanded in Scripture. That should give us great pause. And how we talk, and how we act, and the choices that we make. Pointing people to Christ is more important than your comfort 
than my comfort, than us always agreeing with our government. It's more important. Now, not only do you need to honor and inspect our government, we actually need to live out our convictions. We talked about this the last couple of weeks. Voting is one thing, but the way you live it out is a completely another. We need to live out our convictions. We need to reintroduce God to the public imagination for them to stop hearing what we're against and us chanting, but actually to see who, uh, what God is for by the way that we live out our lives. The problem is it's easy to talk about what we don't like, what the government should change. It's easier than actually doing something about it. You know, that same article, Eugene Cho, he said this. He says, sometimes we are more in love with the idea of changing the world than actually changing the world. Especially in our, in our Western Christianity, we're drawn and enamored to this gospel that just comforts us and cradles us and how he loves us and gives us and blesses us what we need. We're, we're more drawn to this gospel that comforts us than a gospel that disrupts us, that disrupts our lives, that causes us to sacrifice and to make hard choices. And when we are not willing to have our lives disrupted, all we end up being are empty salespeople. Empty salespeople who are teaching people about a false Jesus. Do we speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves? For the rights of all those who are destitute, whether the unborn, the poor, you name it. Do we take up the cause of the fatherless and of the widow? And not just with our hand, not just with our mouths, but with actual our money and our time. This is how the first century church changed the world. This is how they did it. They got their hands dirty. They did not waste time. Let me give you one example. At one time in our world, infanticide, the killing of infants, was not a problem for like anybody. It was not a problem. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about babies that are unborn. I'm talking about born children. It was not a problem. It was even in fact, considered good for society. In fact, in the Romans, in certain parts of the Roman Empire, it was your duty to allow your child to die under circumstances. Your duty. And, and, and here's how it worked. You take your baby, maybe it's because you wanted a boy and you got a girl, or whatever reason you wanted. And, and you would take it down, that baby down to the, the river bank, or you would take that baby to the edge of the forest, and you would just leave your baby exposed to the environment. And it was, this is what the title was called exposure. What a, what a pleasant word, exposure. And, and legally, you were not culpable for the death of your child. Because the idea was, well, you just put your child there and the fates the fates will have it. Fate will take care of it. The baby wants to survive. The fate wants baby to survive. They will. If they don't, they don't. You were innocent. No problem. But from the very beginning, Christians disagreed with this. And when I read about what, how they responded, I don't read about massive protests. I don't read about angry medieval Facebook posts. Not that there was Facebook, I guess. But they would go down to the edges of the forest and they would get the babies. They would go to the edges of the river and they would get the babies and then they would take those babies back and they would feed and start to raise their children. And this acts of selfless rescue, adopting these unwanted babies, it began to have an impact on Roman society. And then in the year 1318, Constantine, the emperor at that time, he declared infanticide a crime. Why the change? Because suddenly, allowing your child to be exposed to the environment to die became a conscience issue. And why did it become a conscience issue? 
because of the teachings of Jesus and the church's obedience to his teachings to love one another as they love themselves. And now sometimes that thing's like really big when I say that we need to go out and we need to live the gospel. And, you, and I give you an example like that. You're like, whoa, I, I, am, I, am, I can't lead that kind of change. Who am I? But think about it. There had to be a first time. There had to be a very first time that a Christian person saw a baby on the bank of a river or on the edge of the forest. There had to be a first time. And there had to be a first time that, that that Christian was willing to go grab that baby and decide to take that baby home for the first time. And there had to be a first time that that Christian decided to keep that baby and feed it with whatever food that they had. And from that first time, it led to a second, to a third, and a fourth, until it spread and it grew. And it makes me wonder, in this church or at home, what first time is waiting? What first time is waiting in your life where God's going to call you to put the gospel into action in an area where your heart is moved? And from that first time, it'll lead to a second and to a third and to a fourth and to a fifth until it spreads to once again change the world. And you're like, yes, I want to be that first time. What do I do? Where do I go? Where do I start? I think there's one question that will help you get there. What does my neighbor need? Lord, help me see what my neighbor needs. If you can pray that prayer, he will show you. And as you move through life, through school, through work, through your neighbors, through your family, uh, an opportunity, I kid you not, will present yourself. And in that moment, you'll have a decision of whether to make that that first step, that first time or not. And as you do, and you are faithful to the Lord, you will see fruit from your obedience. And who knows how much it will grow. Now, I'm not promising these kind of results every time. But success in following God is not based on the results that we can see. It's based on being obedient to him and trusting him with the results. And listen, there's still, let's be honest, there may become a time where you can do all these great things, but culture is going to pressure you, where you're going to have to choose between what is your faith and what is important to you in your life. There, this time may come. I think it'll come eventually. I don't know in our lifetime, but it will come. Second century, there's a pastor, his name was Polycarp, and uh, he lived in Turkey. Kidnapped, I think, uh, 155 AD, and he was commanded to worship a foreign god and to curse Christ. Commanded to. And Polycarp replied, he said, For 80 and six years I have been his servant, and God has done me no wrong. How can I curse my king now, the one who saved me? So, based on that reply, they burned him at the stake. And what was an attempt to silence the Christian faith had the opposite effect. When you take his martyrdom and the many others, people started to realize, man, if people are willing to sacrifice this for this God, there must be something to it. And more conversions to Christianity followed. And I pray that for you and I, that we'll have the courage to exercise this freedom that we have in Christ that we will be willing to speak the truth of our conscience in Christ, no matter what the consequences may be. In your schools, most likely in your workplaces, in your communities, no matter what the cost, that you will be like Peter and John when they were told to stop preaching the gospel in Acts, and their reply was that we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have but may we also do it in such a way that it makes Jesus attractive. When other people are oppressive, when other people are mean-spirited, it doesn't give us the right to return the same. May we be, as it says in Colossians, gracious with our speech, seasoned with salt, that we may represent and point people to our King. Let's pray.